Okay, we're ready to rock and roll. Uh, welcome back, everyone. I hope you're refreshed. I got my sandwich, got my cup of coffee. Okay, but I'm going to wait so you won't hear me chewing. I'm going to wait till the cardiac presentation to start. And, and I do want to give a couple of more introductions to some of the panelists before we introduce Dr. Ruberg, okay? I want to mention Dr. Barry Trachtenberg, also a cardiologist, and he is a native Houstonian, I understand, uh, from Houston Methodist. We are scheduled to have a first meeting there in May, but alas, our May meetings are postponed, so it'll be nice to have him here. And one more quickie is Dr. Jason Ballant, who's a hematologist oncologist from the main campus, the cold campus, right, at the Cleveland Clinic. And Dr. Valent has been hosting our meetings there for several years, and he's been a guest at other cities as well. So now we'll hear from Dr. Rick Ruberg, today's presenter. Uh, he's the amyloid cardiologist at the Boston University Amyloidosis Center. And you don't have to have cardiac involvement to enjoy this presentation. I've seen it. It's pretty awesome. So let's, uh, let's go and start that presentation. Thank you very much, Muriel. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's absolutely my pleasure to be here with you today. Um, my name is Rick Ruberg. I'm a cardiologist at Boston University and the Boston University Amyloidosis Center. Um, I've been working with the ASG for many, many years now, and it really is my pleasure to spend a little time with you and talk to you about what I study and what I treat, and that's cardiac amyloidosis. I'll have to focus today on AL amyloidosis, which is the subject of today's webinar. We'll also talk a little bit about basic cardiac physiology and function, so we're all on the same page and uh, we all kind of have uh, the same basis of understanding before we start. So I'll begin my presentation now. So let's start off by talking about an overview of cardiac function. So as we all know, the job of the heart is to pump blood to the organs of the body. And like any pump that works in cycles, the heart beats cyclically, it has two different distinct phases. One phase is called diastole, which is the phase in which the heart fills, and the other phase is called systole, which is the squeezing phase of the heart. Heart failure is a term that we use in medicine to describe a situation where the heart does not adequately pump blood to the body. It either doesn't pump enough blood or that the pressures required for it to do its job to pump blood are too high. Heart failure, therefore, can result from either problems with the squeezing function or the relaxation function of the heart. Heart failure is not the same thing as a heart attack or a cardiac arrest. Those are medically distinct things. Heart failure is a specific term to describe that the heart muscle itself is failing to basically do its job. Let's talk about cardiac anatomy. I think you all remember from your high school physiology that the heart has two sides, a right and a left, and it has four chambers, two at the top and two at the bottom. The top chambers are called atria, and the bottom chambers are called ventricles. The right side of the heart, as you see my mouse moving around here, receives blood from the body into the right atrium, and then it pumps blood to the lungs through this thing called the pulmonary artery. The, lung, the, blood's, the blood returns from the lungs through pulmonary veins into the left atrium, and then into the left ventricle where blood is pumped to the body. The atria may mainly receive blood, and the ventricles mainly pump, receive and do all the principal pumping of the blood. So you can think about the heart in, you know, in those different ways, either in the right side or the left side, or the uh, upper chambers or the lower chambers, and each of them have their own um, specific functions and dysfunctions. The left ventricle, which is the, the part of the heart that pumps blood to the body, is the most important part in a lot of ways. It's the part that, um, uh, that we experience congestive heart failure prim primarily from when this part doesn't work as well. Um, and also the measurements that, we, uh, that we're familiar with, as we'll talk about during this presentation, things like ejection fraction, et cetera, those are uh, left ventricular functions primarily. This side of the slide illustrates the two phases of the heart, the relaxation phase, where the blood comes in from either the body or the lungs, and the blood is squeezed out to the lungs and to the rest of the body. So I think about the heart like a contractor, and I, I, I have contracting to remind myself that it's not like contracting. I mean, I, I use the term contracting as if you're a contractor. So the heart is many ways like a house. The heart has piping or blood vessels that bring blood from the aorta, the main vessel that carries blood to the body, to the heart muscle. Those are called coronary arteries. And so the contracting uh, equivalent of a plumber 
in medicine is an interventional cardiologist. That person fixes the pipes when they're broken. The conduction system of the heart or the wiring allows the heart to do, uh, its, do its work because it conveys electrical impulses through the heart. It allows the heart to pump at a regular rhythm and efficiently. And the electrician equivalent of the heart is the cardiac electrophysiologist. The machinery that does the pumping, the muscle or the myocardium, that's the medical term, does the work of pumping the blood at an acceptable pressure. But sometimes that doesn't work, as I mentioned to you before. Sometimes the pump fails either because it doesn't, it's not strong enough or because the pressures are too high. To repair the pump, we use medicines. And the heart failure specialist is a person who uses medicines to help make the heart pump better. Finally, the heart has specific valves in it to keep the blood from going backwards. I think of that as kind of like circulation or your, your air circulation in your house, your HVAC system. And, that, and when, when blood goes backwards or when those HVAC uh, uh, kind of the, the, uh, the conduits are, are not allowed blood to go through, that leads to problems we'll talk about in a moment. But your HVAC repair person can be a heart surgeon potentially who could fix a valve or interventional cardiologists uh, as well. So this is a, a cartoon of the electrical version of the electrical uh, system of the heart. So again, you recognize the two atria and the two ventricles. The sinus node at the top of the right atrium is where the heart uh, rhythm originates under most normal circumstances. The impulse then travels passively through the atria, and then it passes through a specialized conduction system called an AV node, and then through these special wires, which are actually special uh, cells that, are gen that, that conduct electricity efficiently in uh, different bundle branches to the heart. And this is, we measure, this is an EKG, which is, an, a, which is the way in which we measure the electrical impulses of the heart. You're all familiar with this from, I'm sure from uh, television dramas and also from high school or maybe even BLS if you did that sort of work. But the ECG basically traces the atrial and the ventricular electrical impulses. Um, this is an example of an ECG in somebody in atrial fibrillation, which is a common heart rhythm problem where the sinus node doesn't actually control the heart rate anymore. It actually, uh, it actually originates chaotically from the atria. And in this case, you can see that while this is a very regular rhythm, in atrial fibrillation, these squiggles are all spaced differently, indicative of um, an irregular heart rate. Atrial fibrillation is one of the most common heart rhythm problems that patients with amyloidosis get. The plumbing system of the heart, as I mentioned, are coronary arteries. And these tubes here are arteries that lead from the aorta and provide uh, nourishing blood uh, to the heart muscle so it can do its work. The right coronary artery prov provides blood to the right ventricle and usually the bottom of the heart. And the left coronary artery, which is subdivided into something called the left main coronary artery, the circumflex coronary artery, and the left anterior descending coronary artery, all provide blood to different parts of the heart. How do we look at the patency and the effectiveness of the heart arteries, we do something called an invasive coronary angiogram. Many of you have had this procedure before, where a tube is placed into uh, an artery in the leg or the wrist, passed up into the aorta, and then connects with one of the arteries of the heart, and, in, and uh, uh, x-ray contrast material is injected, showing you by x-ray the arteries. So this is an example of the left coronary system, and this is an example of the right coronary artery looked at. It's a three-dimensional image looked at in a two-dimensional manner. Um, and so coronary angiography is a way in which we look for uh, blockages in the coronary arteries that potentially could result in, say, a heart attack. Now the heart valves here um, are illustrated in this cartoon. We have four heart valves two on the right side and two on the left side, and the heart valves separate the chambers from each other and also separate the heart from the great blood vessels. Um, and the, on the right side of the heart, you've got the tricuspid valve and the pulmonic valve, and on the left side of the heart, you've got the mitral valve and the aortic valve. Now, normally, the valves open and allow blood to flow freely between the chambers, and then the valve closes, typically either in systole or diastole, depending upon the valve, so the blood doesn't go backwards. Sometimes the blood Sometimes the valves are uh, inappropriately tight, and we call that stenosis. So the blood doesn't actually pass through as easily, and that leads to high pressures on the other side of the valve. Or the valves are regurgitant, meaning that they don't close adequately, and the blood can go backwards into the uh, chamber where it came from, and that can also lead to problems. Echocardiography is the way in which we look at heart valve function primarily, and this is an example. It may not be playing smoothly, <clears throat> depending upon your internet connection, but this is an example of an echocardiogram showing here 
the mitral valve of the left ventricle and the aortic valve of the left ventricle in a patient who also happens to have amyloidosis. So what are signs and symptoms of congestive heart failure? They are pretty um, nonspecific, actually. And as you'll hear, there are other things that overlap, other diseases that overlap. So you have to think about um, congestive heart failure with a kind of a broad mind. So shortness of breath. Um, shortness of breath can be normal. If you run up a flight of stairs, it's normal to feel shortness of breath sometimes, um, but not other times, as you can imagine. Um, but shortness of breath is a, a cardinal feature of congestive heart failure. Leg swelling, abdominal bloating, and swelling of the abdomen and belly. Low blood pressure, because the heart doesn't generate enough, um, enough uh, circulating blood volume. Fatigue and weakness, weakness because, the, again, because of poor circulation. Um, and as I mentioned, heart failure can result from problems with the systolic squeezing function of the heart, and that's principally measured echocardiographically by something called the LVEF, or left ventricular ejection fraction. These are terms I'm sure you've heard of, if you have uh, ever had an echocardiogram. Diastolic problems, problems with the relaxation of the heart. This is where the heart becomes stiffer, and we have ways to assess that also by echocardiography. And finally, as I mentioned, if there are valve problems, if the valves are too tight, or too leaky, you can also develop congestive heart failure. So I'm gonna move into a case now that brings some of these, these, uh, these basic physiology uh, uh, principles uh, into a real, a real clinical case uh, of a real person whom I saw at the amyloidosis center over the past couple of years. So MT is a 61 year old woman who had no significant past medical history who began to note shortness of breath. Remember, no shortness of breath is one of the first signs of, potential signs of congestive heart failure. She had it for about six months. So she went to her doctor and was found to be in atrial fibrillation, that rhythm I mentioned to you before. Um, the rhythm was irregular. And so she was referred to a cardiologist who started her on anticoagulation. And we didn't talk about this, but the principal problem with atrial fibrillation is a predisposition to a blood clot in the heart, which can lead to a stroke, which is obviously a, a dreaded and, and terrible complication. So treatment with blood thinning medications or anticoagulation is usually standard of care in patients with atrial fibrillation. Um, except under certain circumstances. But unfortunately, um, she, she didn't get any better. An echocardiogram was done and her LVEF, her ejection fraction, was normal. And so the doctor thought, hey, this is all related to atrial fibrillation. We're just going to treat the atrial fibrillation and she's going to get better. But she didn't. Her symptoms got worse. So she was referred for a coronary angiogram, which was completely normal, just like the one I showed you, although that wasn't uh, an example from this patient. But because she's not getting better, the doctor said, let's repeat the echocardiogram because something isn't making sense. And lo and behold, her ejection fraction was now much, much lower, 38%. Um, that means that 38% of the blood that enters the heart is squeezed out. And that's, nor that's not normal. Normally about half of the blood, typically around 53% for a woman to be exact, but about half of the blood the heart takes in is squeezed out with each cardiac cycle, each squeeze. Hers was working only at about 38%. So that's definitely not normal. And this time they recognized that her heart muscle was thickened, which is also not normal. The most common cause of heart thickening is high blood pressure, but she had no history of high blood pressure. So they were concerned. They referred her for a specialty test called a cardiac MRI. And that MRI showed a pattern that was very consistent with cardiac amyloidosis, which prompted referral to our center at Boston University. Um, cardiac MRI is a very common way in which doctors are, identify amyloidosis because they see a characteristic pattern. So at our center, she had an abdominal fat aspirate, which is a, a small sample of fat taken from the belly, which showed amyloid deposits. She had a bone marrow biopsy showing um, something called a lambda plasma cell dyscrasia, showing a clonal proliferation of plasma cells in her bone marrow, something that, that Dr. Landau um, has already gone over today, um, with amyloid deposits. And she had lab tests that demonstrated a very elevated lambda free light chain. And many of you probably know your lambda free light chain. This number is very, very high relative to the normal ranges you can see here. She also had a very high NT pro BNP. Normal is really less than 300 or 330. Um, and um, and uh, she also had an elevated cardiac troponin. So these numbers are, are quite abnormal. And so therefore the diagnosis in this case was AL amyloidosis lambda subtype. But unfortunately she had advanced cardiac involvement by the time she reached us stage 3B. So we initially, we immediately initiated chemotherapy and because of her relatively young age and relatively um, uh, serious heart uh, uh, impairment, we considered referral for cardiac transplantation. 
And I'll get to what happened to her later in the presentation. So what's amyloid? And I, I, I apologize if this is review for any of you, but interestingly, amyloid's been known for quite some time. It was, it was coined by the uh, great pathologist by the name of Rudolf Virchow who in uh, 1854 was looking under a microscope and saw this substance that he thought was related to sugar. Turns out it was, he, was, he was right, he called, it, was, it was abnormal, but it was related to protein. But because it was, he thought it was related to sugar and starch, he gave it the name amylum or amyloid from the Latin uh, for the word for, for starch. Um, what we know now is that amyloid is not a sugar, but a protein problem, and it's, it's characterized pathologically by any protein that takes up this special stain called Congo red. And as you've already heard, amyloid is a very specific misfolded protein problem, a problem where the lambda light chain, in this particular case for this patient, but other proteins can also misfold, de deposits this amyloid in tissue uh, in a special orientation that takes up this, this Congo red stain. Many of you probably know that one of the main problems with identifying amyloidosis is delay in diagnosis. And this is a publication by Isabel Lusada, who is the director of the Amyloidosis Research Consortium. She did a study a number of years ago asking patients about their disease course, their, their journey before they got to an accurate diagnosis. And what they found, what she found was that a number of patients went many years. Look at this, there's patients who go one to two, two to three, or even more than three years from symptom onset to diagnosis, really long time. Our patient actually was, had a very astute clinician who recognized her uh, uh, symptoms. And so she was actually only six to 12 months from symptoms to diagnosis, which is actually pretty good relative to the rest of the world, but still probably not good enough. Many patients also have to go to a bunch of doctors before the diagnosis is made. Um, a third of patients in this survey actually had to see five or more doctors before the correct dose and diagnosis was ultimately made. And you can see here that most of the time, in this case, AL amyloidosis is correctly diagnosed by what you would expect, the hematologist, because AL amyloidosis is a hematologic problem primarily, or the kidney specialist, or the cardiologist. Um, so, you know, those of us who work in the world of amyloidosis are really working to shorten the time to diagnosis and to make diagnosis much more accessible to patients, but also to simplify algorithms for, for providers. So cardiac amyloidosis results from thickening of the heart muscle as, as our patient had, and that leads to impairment of the compliance or elastic properties of the heart. The problem here is that the heart becomes stiffer and thicker and it just doesn't expand as easily. And that, that causes the pressures of the heart to be higher when, when the blood flows into it and higher pressures are necessary to fill up that heart so that it, it's primed and can eject blood uh, as it needs to. That, those increased pressures cause congestion, and that congestion then translates back to the organs that are connected to the heart. The legs, in the case of the right side of the heart, and the lungs, in the case of the left side of the heart, resulting in congestive heart failure symptoms of shortness of breath and swelling. As I also mentioned, that the heart pumping function is also impaired with amyloidosis, initially first subtly, and then much more significantly in later stages of disease, causing reduction in the ejection fraction. And that results in lower blood pressure, weakness, faster heart rates, because the heart compensates by going faster to keep the blood flowing, and, and general level of fatigue and poor exercise tolerance. Cardiac amyloidosis is divided principally into two major types. The type we're gonna talk about today more is light chain disease, in which case the light chain what we are, that we already mentioned misfolds and caused amyloid. That's why it's called AL or amyloid light chain. But another very important type of amyloid that we're not gonna be talking about today is called transthyretin or TTR. That's why it's called ATTR, amyloid from TTR, also known as pre-albumin. The TTR is then subdivided into a non-hereditary type that we call wild type or a hereditary form in which a patient inherits a variation in the TTR gene that predisposes the patient to the development of amyloidosis. Today, we're gonna to focus on AL amyloidosis. The symptoms of AL amyloidosis, as many of you know, are very variable and can affect many different organ systems and overlap other more common diseases, which is why doctors often fail to recognize amyloidosis early on. Let's start with, um, with the, uh, the arms and the uh, upper, upper extremities. So carpal tunnel syndrome or bilateral carpal tunnel syndrome resulting from thickening of the ligament um, because of amyloid deposition that surrounds the median nerve of the wrist is a common uh, feature that often predates the development of other clinical symptoms. That's particularly true in TTR amyloidosis, but also true in AL amyloidosis. 
People also develop, as you know, um, uh, uh, as you probably know, sometimes symptoms of peripheral neuropathy or numbness or tingling, either due to carpal tunnel syndrome or because of direct um, involvement of the nerves by amyloid deposits. Lower extremities get swollen um, in the setting of congestive heart failure or in the setting of renal failure. Um, patients develop easy bruising because of the, uh, the, the because of capillary fragility or because of the ab or abnormalities in, in uh, blood coagulation um, because of the AL amyloidosis. The deposition of amyloid in the kidneys can lead to something called nephrotic syndrome or loss of protein in the urine, which clinically presents itself as bubbles in the urine or, um, or swelling of the lower extremities. Poor appetite, uh, bloating, as I already mentioned to you from congestive heart failure, autonomic dysfunction related to deposition of amyloid in the nerves that control and innervate the gastrointestinal tract, leading to either increased or decreased gastrointestinal motility, which manifests as either diarrhea or constipation. And I've already spent a great length talking about shortness of breath, palpitations because of fast heart rate or arrhythmia, fatigue, or even chest pain or chest pressure because of high pressures in the heart. Macroglossia or enlarged tongue is a, is a uh, relatively uncommon but very uh, typical feature of AL amyloidosis and discoloration around the eyelids um, that's called periorbital purpura or ecchymosis is also a feature of AL amyloidosis. And finally, because of um, either low blood pressure from heart failure or autonomic system dysfunction, patients can have dizziness or lightheadedness that we sometimes need to treat with medications. A lot of symptoms here for AL amyloidosis, and unfortunately, they overlap with a lot of common problems like diabetes and, uh, peripheral, uh, for example, peripheral neuropathy from diabetes or heart failure. There's many, many other reasons why someone may develop congestive heart failure that are much more common than amyloidosis. So it's something that clinicians really need to think about and patients need to really be on, also need to uh, be familiar with so they can, they can tell their providers. AL amyloidosis is a rare disease, um, and I think we've known this now through multiple repeated uh, uh, tests um, of different patient populations. The US FDA defines a rare disease as affecting less than 200,000 people. AL amyloidosis affects many, many less than 200,000 new people each year. About 5,000 to no more than 10,000, probably around 7,500 new cases of AL amyloidosis are diagnosed every year in the United States. But about 80% of those patients have some degree of heart involvement, either by clinically manifest heart involvement by symptoms or um, heart involvement that's only measurable by abnormalities in blood tests. Kidney involvement is also very common, as you can see here, and other organs are, are potentially less commonly, as you can see, less commonly involved. How do we identify heart involvement? Uh, well, certainly symptoms are the principal way in which we do it. So we take a thorough history and we do a physical exam when we evaluate patients. But we also look at blood tests. And unfortunately, there are no specific blood tests for cardiac amyloidosis. I've already shown you that the light chain is abnormal in systemic amyloidosis, but abnormal light chain does not mean that there's cardiac involvement. It just means that there is a plasma cell problem. So, but we do look at these heart-specific biomarkers or blood tests that can identify heart involvement in the setting of abnormal uh, light chain or AL amyloidosis. And the two principal heart tests that we look at are something called BNP or B-type natriuretic peptide or NT-proBNP, which is, a, uh, which is a, a, a similar version of BNP. They are not, however, interchangeable in terms of their, um, their assay ranges. So NT-proBNP has a very different range of normal than BNP. These are generally thought of as indexes of the pressure of the heart. They go up and they go down relative to heart pressure. Higher is more abnormal, lower is more normal. Troponin, cardiac troponin, either troponin I or troponin T, again, very different assay ranges, are indexes of injury to the heart muscle. Troponin is a contractile, as part of the contractile uh, apparatus of the heart muscle, the heart cell, actually. Um, and and it should not normally be released into the circulation, but in situations of cardiac injury, though it's released and abnormal uh, cardiac troponin is indicative of, of heart injury. And again, higher is more abnormal. We know that biomarkers uh, really predict um, survival in AL amyloidosis. So our hematology colleagues um, uh, it, uh, are, are very much um, 
facile with understanding what these numbers mean. And there are a number of different schemes out there to identify BNP and NG pro BNP and troponin. And I just call your attention to one that we recently published at Boston University show, using BNP and NT pro BNP that's really based on the work of uh, Dr. Dispensieri at Mayo Clinic, who first validated this tool using NT pro BNP and troponin T. But using BNP and, and, and uh, troponin I, we can also evaluate three, three different or four different groups. Um, one of them is subdivided based upon the magnitude of increase in these markers. And what I want to illustrate to you is that many patients can have abnormal markers. They would be in stage, stage, say, stage two, where either the BNP or the troponin is abnormal, potentially indicative of cardiac amyloidosis. Back in 2004, when Dr. Dispensieri first described it, those patients had a median survival of only about 10 months. Terrible. Now, based upon our mo most recent data at Boston University, which is really the result of 15 years of development um, in new drugs um, at, at, at across the world, not simply at our center, the median survival is now on the order of 10 years. So totally different situation, largely because of, of drug development um, and effective treatments for AL amyloidosis. Unfortunately, patients with the most advanced form of disease still are at the highest risk. Um, and so we want to catch people before they get to stage 3B or 3, where they're here more in stage 1 or stage 2, where their survival is much better and the treatment options are much more variable. We use echocardiography to identify cardiac amyloidosis. LVEF, I've already mentioned to you, is a measure of the squeezing function of the heart. More than 50% is considered normal. We also measure wall thickness. Which is, a, which is a relatively imprecise, unfortunately, measure of how much thickening relates to amyloid. We measure relaxation and diastolic function. We measure something called longitudinal strain as well, which is a new measure, which I think is very sensitive to changes in, in, in heart function, uh, which I'm sorry, indicates changes in heart function, but very sensitive to uh, improvements or progression. We use cardiac MRI, as I've already mentioned, um, and there we look for something called late gadolinium enhancement and extracellular volume fraction. I'm just throwing these terms out to you because you may have heard them and you may have questions about them that I'm happy to answer. And less commonly in AL, but much more commonly in ATTR, we look at nuclear imaging, which is the uh, ability of the heart, which is, the, which is the ability to identify mostly ATTR amyloidosis in the heart. Although we have learned that um, patients with AL amyloidosis can also have abnormal nuclear imaging tests. The gold standard for identifying cardiac amyloidosis is still the heart biopsy. We reserve this for only certain scenarios, but what you see here is the classic red staining of amyloid deposits in normal heart muscle um, with, uh, with this green biorefringence, which is typical of AL amyloidosis. This cartoon from Dr. Grogan's review, her excellent review in the journal Heart, shows that you have heart muscle here where uh, that is basically kind of uh, interspersed by amyloid deposits, these, these amyloid fibrils that again, fluoresce green under polarized light. Um, the light chains themselves illustrated here are directly toxic to the heart muscle, um, and they lead to something called apoptosis, which is cell death resulting from the, uh, the light chain. So amyloid deposits, AL amyloidosis, causes direct injury to the heart muscle as well as um, deposition of, of amyloid deposits. And we can talk more about that as well. But it, that's why it's critically important to get rid of the light chain as fast as possible to remove both the immediate injury effect as well as to stop progression of deposits. This is an example of an echocardiogram, I apologize if it doesn't play smoothly, of a patient with, uh, with amyloidosis showing the two different views that we commonly look at, showing very much thickening of the heart muscle. I don't have a normal here to compare, but it should be less than, uh, than uh, this distance here. It's almost twice as thick as normal. Um, but the squeezing function here is still quite normal um, in terms of its LVEF. Again, LVEF reduction is a later stage manifestation of AL amyloidosis. This, this slide illustrates longitudinal strain. And again, I just show this to you just so you know what your doctors are looking at. Um, normal global longitudinal strain is in the order of minus 18%. Um, what we see here is a difference in the strain in the apex of the heart versus the base of the heart. And so when doctors see this pattern in a patient whom they don't know has amyloidosis, they should think about it. And that's work that we, that we work on. This is a cardiac MRI showing patients with um, something without any LGE or enhancement. And you can see this patient that has more LGE because it's all white, and all this white here indicates amyloid deposition in this patient's heart, um, showing, uh, again, a pattern very class classic for amyloidosis. This is why MRI is used often by cardiologists as a first test to differentiate who does and who doesn't have cardiac amyloidosis. Very, very useful. And this is the extracellular volume measurement I was showing you before 
normal is about 28%. And this patient has a value that's three times normal, um, or two and a half to three times normal. Again, very characteristic of amyloidosis. The nuclear imaging test, again, is much more important for ATTR amyloidosis. Just bear in mind that some patients with AL can also have diagnostic, it's called uptake. And so it's important that any patient who has um, the presence of an abnormal light chain has uh, further testing, even if they've got uh, TTR, up, I'm sorry, pyrophosphate uptake. Again, I can leave that more to the Q&A. Turning briefly now to treatment for AL amyloidosis, again, this was covered in depth by Dr. Landau. Chemotherapy can take the form of pills or injections, and we've dramatically extended the, the, uh, the uh, survival for patients with AL amyloidosis, turning it into essentially a chronic disease for, for most patients or many patients, as opposed to one in which we really didn't have anything to offer uh, as little as 15 years ago, or minimal to offer, I should say, not little to offer, but not as much. Um, we use stem cell transplantation in our center as a highly effective way to reduce light chains quickly, but it's a, it's a, it's a more uh, aggressive regimen that has higher rates of toxicity, and it's only reserved for people with mild to moderate heart involvement. The goal of treatment is to attain a complete hematologic response, and that means that there is no longer any evidence of plasma cell abnormality in the blood or the bone marrow. And that's been associated with improved heart function, reduction in the heart wall thickness, and reduced reliance on medications. Now, as far as treatment of the heart failure is concerned, these um, normal treatments that we use for congestive heart failure really don't work for amyloidosis. Our main treatments involve uh, reducing the fluid in the body, diuretics, and I'm going to show you the next slide about specific treatments. Um, diuretics are the mainstay of therapy because they reduce the amount of fluid in the body, which reduces the pressures in the heart. That reduces swelling in the legs, shortness of breath, and makes people feel generally better and improves the heart function overall. But the problem is that too much diuresis can result in too little, uh, too little fluid in the body that can lead to lower blood pressure and kidney dysfunction. And so for many patients, it's often walking that tightrope between too much or too little heart function. And because the heart's been affected by amyloidosis, that range in which patients would normally have to work with is reduced significantly. These are some drugs that many of you are probably taking. Lasix, uh, uh, or furosemide, torsemide, bumetanide. These are diuretics that we commonly use, loop diuretics. We also use spironolactone and aplerinone, other types of diuretics that are effective. We use anticoagulants commonly, typically in atrial fibrillation. These are some of the common drugs that we use. Coumadin is the old drug, um, which we still use a fair amount of. Newer drugs include Eliquis or Xarelto, Apixaban or Rivaroxaban. And finally, in patients who have atrial fibrillation, we use drugs to help control heart rhythm frequently. Most commonly, we use the drug amiodarone. Um, we also may use low doses of the drug metoprolol, but many patients are completely intolerant to metoprolol or other beta blockers, and so we avoid those medications. Every patient is different. As I mentioned, the hematological response is defined by the, uh, the light chain numbers um, and the bone marrow. We also, would, I'd like to differentiate between that and organ-specific response. An organ-specific -re response as far as the heart's concerned, in other words, are you getting better, is defined by changes in the NT, pro, BNP, or BNP. We look for more than a 30% reduction. Changes in the troponin, improvements in the echocardiogram, improvements in wall thickness or ejection fraction or relaxation or heart pressures, improved symptoms, uh, and reduction in the diuretic requirement. It's important to remember that the organ-specific response often lags behind the hematologic response by six to 12 months. Going back to our patient, you can see here that her light chain numbers with chemotherapy went down dramatically. In fact, they totally normalized, which is very impressive. Um, and also her BNP went from over 1,500 to uh, really down to about 300, which is much more than a 30% reduction. And so she has both a hematologic response and a cardiac response that actually occurred um, in relatively short order, on the order of just about six months after therapy. This patient actually never did get a heart transplant. She's doing uh, still well today. She didn't require a heart transplant um, and, uh, and as was uh, recently seen in our clinic uh, uh, just last month, actually. So what can you do as a caregiver and or a patient? Watch your sodium intake. Salt is uh, a major offender in congestive heart failure because salt leads to fluid retention and that can lead to shortness of breath of swelling. We generally re re recommend that people try to limit their salt intake to one and a half to two grams, two, two grams per day. Also, we also recommend that people with congestive heart failure watch their fluid intake. Try to limit your fluid intake to less than about a half gallon to two liters a day when you have congestive heart failure um, because that can also lead to fluid retention. 
we ask that people watch their weight and they call your do you call your doctor if your weight increases by more than two pounds on two consecutive days. You may need more diuretic. Obviously, I also would add that situations vary. If you're in the summertime and you don't have any air conditioning on and it's super hot and you're sweating a lot, you might need more liquid. Um, so everything is, is got to be taken in the context um, in which, which, which people are, are currently living. I recommend that people watch their blood pressure and you call your doctor if your blood pressure is really low or really high. Um, and also watch for new symptoms um, that might indicate either a toxicity from a drug or that a drug isn't working, such as dizziness or palpitations or swelling or shortness of breath. Lastly, um, in, the, uh, in the current COVID-19 pandemic, many patients ask me questions about what do I do specifically about COVID-19? I think the most important thing is that you avoid getting sick and you maintain social distancing and you're careful about the people you interact with um, and you're careful about, um, about the, uh, the things that you touch and the food that you eat. Um, and so I'm sure that you, you're all quite familiar with the precautions that you should take, but we could talk about that more in the Q&A. As uh, patients with AL amyloidosis on chemotherapy or all have recently been on chemotherapy or had a stem cell transplant, you're definitely at higher risk of developing complications from COVID because of immune suppression. I also think that in, in the COVID era, it's really important that you stay in contact with your doctors. Of course, it's always important that you do that, but even more so now. Um, and the problem with COVID-19 is that the symptoms of COVID, which include a coronavirus infection, which include cough and shortness of breath, could be confused with congestive heart failure. So how do you know whether you've got one or the other? Well, I'll tell you that fever is not a feature of congestive heart failure. So if you're, if you're um, running a temperature, then that's not heart failure and you should definitely call your doctor. On the other hand, if you're gaining weight and you're getting swelling, that's probably not COVID because COVID doesn't usually lead to uh, weight gain and increased swelling. Although you could certainly imagine that if you have COVID for a period of time and you stop taking your medications, you might develop heart failure on top of your co coronavirus infection. So again, I think you just have to be really careful um, and again, stay in touch with your doctors. We're there for you to help answer questions for, questions for you. So with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention today. Um, uh, it's really been a pleasure to spend uh, about half an hour or 35 to 40 minutes with you. It's truly a, a very difficult time, I think, for all of us. Um, we're going to get through it together. Uh, we doctors are here for you. So if you have any questions, um, you're welcome to reach out to your doctors or me. Um, and I look forward to answering your questions in the Q&A session uh, just after this. Thank you. Wow. Thanks so much, Dr. Rupert. That was really wonderful. Uh, and you, you know, uh, we will have copies of the presentations, both from Dr. Rubert and Dr. Landau, and uh, we will share them. Uh, I do want to get in a few more bios of some of our panelists. Uh, Dr. Robert Vessio is a hematologist oncologist from Cedar sinai in Los Angeles. He's been hosting our meetings there since 2004 and has attended more than three dozen meetings over the years. It was at our first meeting with Dr. Vessio that he uttered the now famous, often quoted sentence, someday this disease will be a treatable nuisance. Dr. David Walensky is a cardiologist with the Cleveland Clinic in Western Florida. He was going to, our first, going to host our first meeting at his center when the virus hit and we had to postpone it. And Dr. Jeffrey Zonder is a hematologist oncologist in Carmenos in Detroit. He's hosted our Detroit meetings since 2005. He's also a frequent guest at many of our local meetings, he's one of our most avid supporters. And I think he's been to more meetings probably than anybody except me and Paula. Uh, 